A small but dedicated group of people worldwide now spends their spare time trying to assist the police and solve other mysteries by trawling through social media profiles, scouring online high school yearbooks, sifting through coroner's photographs, and more. Online communities such as Reddit and 4chan have threads devoted to picking apart riddles while sites like web sleuths are created for the purpose of crime solving. These are the top five mysteries solved by the internet. Number five. A Taiwanese high school student posted a long open letter on Facebook, both in Chinese and Indonesian, in an attempt to look for Dwai, an Indonesian nanny who took care of her when she was a baby until she went to kindergarten from 2000 to 2004. The letter begins by explaining that Su Zihan was less than a year old and her parents decided to hire a nanny from Indonesia to help care for their children. Su said that after she was born, Dwai took care of her until she was four and was the first person she saw every morning. Dwai took time to play house with her, took her to kindergarten, and taught her some simple songs in Indonesia. Su said, Dwai was a very important part of my childhood. She was like a second mother. I felt very secure when I was with her. One time, she came back from vacation and brought me a teddy bear as a gift for my fourth birthday. I was so happy that I bounced around the house with the bear thanking her. Sue says that she recalled that one morning, about a week after she received the birthday gift, she couldn't find Dwai in the house. Her parents broke the news that Dwai's work contract had expired and she chose to return to Indonesia. When Sue was about nine years old, Dwai came to her home for a brief visit and said she was working at a factory. She left her phone number, but Sue said she lost it when her cell phone broke. In recent years, Sue said she tried calling Dwai's labor broker in an attempt to contact her, but to no avail. In January, Sue wrote about Dwai in a school essay on the topic of what she cherished the most. She said, I immediately thought of the teddy bear that she gave me. On April 16, 2020, she wrote a letter in both Chinese and Indonesian to Chinese language magazines and Indonesian websites. After her Facebook post circulated widely, the story was picked up by Indonesian media on Saturday, and through a series of coincidences, a labor broker in Taiwan was able to give Sue a contact number for Dwai. Almost immediately, Sue sent Dwai a text message in Indonesian saying, I love you, a phrase that she was taught when she was a child. Sue then expressed gratitude to everyone who helped her find the number, saying the search ended with a miracle. She said, quote, I'm very appreciative that everyone helped me find her. She also said she was happy to see Dwai is in good health. Dwai responded by saying, Little sister, you've gained weight. I miss you. On her Facebook page, Sue urged people to say I love you to those who are most important in their lives while they still can. Number 4 A man checked into a hotel in Amanda Park, Washington on September 14, 2001, under the name Lyle Stevick. He took his own life on September 17. The apparent act hit headlines soon after and sparked a raft of conspiracy theories that his passing was linked to the terror atrocities that had just taken place. Some claimed he appeared to be of Middle Eastern descent and speculated that he may have been involved with the hijackers after police released a photo of him. His name was an alias based on a character from a novel titled You Must Remember This. In the book, the character Stevick contemplates ending his life. This man's true identity remained a mystery until May of 2018. Authorities have now identified the man with the help of the nonprofit DNA Doe Project organization a team of 20 volunteers who work hundreds of hours to try and match Stevick's DNA with samples uploaded by donors. About 4,000 members of Reddit scoured missing persons databases like NameU and Doe Network. They posted Stevick's physical characteristics, 6 foot 2, 140 pounds, black hair, hazel eyes, attached earlobes, and other descriptors on social media with the hope that someone somewhere would recognize him. They finally found a match with the family, proving he wasn't Middle Eastern, but in fact a mix of Hispanic and Native American. His relatives reportedly thought he was still alive, but had simply left because he didn't want to be associated with them. 
It turns out that Stevik was a runaway, a troubled young man who for one reason or another decided to end his life. He was 25 years old at the time. His real name has not been released at the request of the family, who is finally allowed to grieve for some 17 years after his death. Number 3 At the age of 17, Todd Matthews heard about an unsolved mystery surrounding the passing of a victim simply known as Tent Girl and took it upon himself to work out her identity. The girl had been found lifeless and wrapped in a tent wrapper in the 1960s and despite police investigations, the girl was unable to be identified. She was later buried with a gravestone that read Tent Girl. It just so happened that it was Matthew's father-in-law who discovered the girl's remains on the side of the road. Matthews heard about this crime as a teenager in 1987 and decided to do some of his own research into the matter. Obviously, at the time of the girl's death, the internet wasn't around to help police solve the crime, so Matthews would later use it to his advantage. Having lost two siblings himself as a young child, Matthews couldn't help but feel empathy for the girl whose headstone didn't have a name. At 17 years old, he started the manual process of his investigations by looking through newspaper articles, speaking to his father-in-law, and making phone calls. Despite working on the investigation for years to no avail, when the internet was created in the 1990s, Matthews decided to create a website in the hope of solving the crime. He explained, quote, I created a site for Tint Girl, and I gathered up everything that I did know about her. And I thought, well, maybe if I just put something online. In 1998, Matthews discovered a description of Taylor, posted by the Hackman family, on a missing persons website. They had a relative who had gone missing in Lexington, Kentucky in late 1967. He emailed information on the tent girl to Rosemary Westbrook, who was listed as a contact for the family. She believed that the information matched her missing sister and contacted the sheriff's office. They confirmed elements of her description of her sister, including a distinctive gap between the top part of her center teeth. Matthew said, it was clear at the time, that's who I was looking for. Barbara Hackman Taylor was married and went missing from her home. Her late husband, George Earl Taylor, was a carnival worker and the prime suspect in the case. He did not file a missing persons report, but told her family that she'd left him for another man. He passed away of cancer in October of 1987. Number 2 Greg May was an antique dealer with an excellent eye for Civil War artifacts. He was also a tattoo artist. A few months before his 56th birthday, he vanished from Bellevue, Iowa. Then, a few months later, some of his prized antiques began to pop up in odd places. In 2001, a truck driver named Ronald Telfer had noticed a seemingly abandoned plastic bucket at a Missouri truck stop. At the time, he didn't investigate further. When Telfer came back a month later and the bucket was still there, he decided to check it out. He just wanted the bucket to feed his pigs back home, so he dumped out what he thought were animal remains trapped in a block of hardened concrete. It wasn't until months afterward that he came back and found what it really was, a human head. The police were notified and an autopsy was performed on the head. The medical examiner had hopes that the concrete retained the facial features of the victim. Upon careful removal of the concrete, the medical examiner was disappointed to find out that a hat had been placed over the head before the concrete was poured. This left no recognizable impression in the concrete. The Kearney Police Department posted information about the head on their website in hopes of identifying the victim. The investigators knew the head was that of a 40 to 60 year old man with teeth in good condition but extensive dental work. The rest of the story is intricate, bizarre, and profoundly sad. Doug De Bruin killed his best friend, Gregory May, and might have gotten away with it if it wasn't for the steadfast efforts of web sleuth, Ellen Leach, who identified the skull by seeing May's photo on a missing persons website. The police investigation eventually led to the arrest of May's friend, De Bruin. He claimed that his girlfriend, Miller, had taken May's life and that he had then helped to dismember the body. He said they dumped the body in the Miss River with his head being left in a bucket of concrete at a truck stop. De Bruin was found guilty of first degree and sentenced to life in prison without parole. 
Ian Miller were also found guilty of theft charges, though she wasn't charged over the crime. Number 1. Paulette Jaster mysteriously vanished from her home at age 25 from Michigan town in 1979, putting her family on the road for a decade-long search for her. Until 2014, Jaster's family didn't know what happened to her. That's when forensic anthropologist Sharon Derrick received a hot tip via the internet who had put together the similarities between the cases about a Jane Doe found in Harris County, Texas. Working with no DNA or dental x-rays and an unsolved mystery more than 30 years old, Derek was able to confirm with old autopsy photographs and freckles that the body was Jaster. Dr. Sharon M. Derek said, People get freckles and freckles sometimes fade, but were able to track three, two on the left cheek and one near the right eye. The National Missing and Identified Person System says the victim in the hit-and-run case had been looking for a ride to Beaumont, Texas at a truck stop immediately before her death and had no identification. Although it came 30 years after the fact, it helped her family find closure. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you liked this video, be sure to click that like button. Also, don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell to keep up to date with all of our future uploads. But I've been Ty Knotts and I'll catch you guys in the next video.